Vivek, it's a pleasure to have you here and, and welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. So yes, as Xavi said, I will talk about the predictability of the future. And this is joint work with Roshi Liu and Carl Vondrick. And as a first note, if you, you know, feel free to interrupt me at any point in the middle of the presentation, um, if you have any question. All right, so to start with, I will show you a video clip, right? And I will ask you uh, to predict what will happen next. So like to answer this question, what will they do next? Options are handshake, kiss, and hug. So, and this is not a trick question, just this is a question to start things off. Uh, so you can use the Zoom chat um, to answer this question. I can, I can replay the video if you want. What will happen next? A, handshake, B, kiss, and C, hug. And I will ask you to please answer in the chat something, or I will not proceed with the talk. All right, thanks. So most people said case, I think only one person said um, a handshake. So let's see. Um, so if we play the whole clip, we get case. Yeah, so well, it, was, it looks, yeah, it looks like it was a case. I think this was an easy one. Um, just to warm up a little bit, I'll, I'll, let's do another one. Um, here the options are um, sit down, jump, and dance to the question, what will he do next? I can play it again. A, sit down, B, jump, C, dance. I saw the movie. <laughs> hey, A, A. Awesome. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I guess everyone answered, um, sit down, and if I play the whole clip, <laughs> we can see that this, no, this man is indeed sitting down, right? So. Okay, that was another um, easy one. So this is the final one I will ask you to answer. And again, predict what will they do next. A, handshake, B, high five, C, eat. Play it again. All right, so looking at the chat, um, it was kind of divided between A and B. I think most people said A, but there's also a few high five B. Um, well, it turns, it turns out in this case, it's not as easy before, right? Like, um, like actually, I don't know what will happen. Like if you, if you want to check what will happen, you can go to the office and watch. This is season two, episode 16. But I guess the point here is that most of the times the future is unpredictable, right? Like I would say it's kind of, kind of, like, not, maybe not impossible to predict what they will do next, but if I had to predict, it will definitely be very uncertain. And I will not be able, I would not be able to predict this um, with certainty or like properly. So what does it mean? Like, does it mean that, you know, we cannot predict anything that, you know, all hope is lost, that's it. Um, let's, you know, um, let's not predict anything or we can still, there's still something that we can predict with certainty. Well, it turns out that there's something we can predict with certainty, right? We can actually predict that they will greet each other. And actually, I, I think we would be pretty certain that um, this is the correct um, prediction. So what did I do here? What I did is like we were uncertain about the prediction at a very specific level. So we went and predicted at the more abstract level. So greet is just an abstraction of both handshake and high five, right? Or like if you want to say it another way, handshake and high five are just specific cases of greeting. So instead of putting all our money into A or B, obviously C is not an, a possible solution, but like instead of putting all our money into A or B, which are two possible futures, we hedge the bet and predict greed, which is something more general and abstract. And this, we can do this in general, right? So depending on how certain or uncertain we are about the future, we can move up or down in this abstraction level we want to predict. If we are very confident, we will um, predict at a very specific level. If we are more uncertain, we will predict at a more abstract level. And this is the main idea that I, that I want to put across today. And in the framework I will introduce, the selection of this level of abstraction that we want to predict that um, will occur naturally, um, as we will see next. So before you know, going to the method, um, just to put this into a little bit of a context, um, well, the context of the work is self-supervised learning, and probably all of you know about it. And you know, self-supervised learning has been um, key recently in a lot of different fields, like from NLP, training mass language models, to, you know, um, with birds and, and similar models. 
um, to, you know, image with Moco and Sinclair, Sinclair and so on, and like in video with VPC, audio speech and other fields. And the main driver of self-supervised learning is prediction. So it's like predict, let's say the prediction of parts of the data given other parts of the data. And in terms of video, this is usually predicting the future. A little bit like the examples I was showing you before, right? So predicting the future. But in video specifically, like in, in future prediction of video, there are fundamental uncertainties and you can't always predict a specific future. So the main point is that for, let's say for self-supervised learning of video representations, we need frameworks that can naturally handle these uncertainties. Now in practice, I know to be a little bit slightly more specific, when we compute video representations, in general, we embed videos in a feature space or a representation space, which is usually a you know, multidimensional Euclidean space. And there are a lot of predictive models in the video literature that you know, work on this Euclidean space, um, like, like the one showed in the slide. And we want to be slightly even more specific than that. Um, in, you know, the specific setup of our problem is the following. We have a video, which is, you know, this video clip here represented by these frames, and we are given actually just the red frames, and we want to predict something about the blue frames. In this case, this something is just like um, the representation of these blue frames in this embedding um, Euclidean, uh, whatever, like representation space, right? So we want, given the red frames, we want to predict this point here. Now, as I said before, this point here that represents this specific future is not the only possible future given the red frames. So like in this specific case, there's, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a uh, gymnast basically running and then jumping on this vault. And, and what's going on is then, then the gymnast is landing facing forward. However, there could be like other multiple possible futures given these red frames. Like you, the gymnast could maybe land and fall to the ground or the gymnast could land and face in some other direction or do a slightly different um, twist here at the, in the air. So, so there are a lot of different possible futures given these this past frames. Now, uh, the predictive models in you know, this Euclidean space that basically we train to minimize distances between the prediction and the actual future, what they will predict is uh, the mean between all these possible futures, because this is like the point that would minimize the loss in, in expectancy. Now, it is not clear what this mean or what this average you know, of, of possible futures actually means. So there is significant work trying to fix this problem, like in the, in the community, in the literature. And there's you know, some work on trying to represent this with you know, you know, probabilistic models instead of predicting a you know, deterministic point. You, know, you predict a distribution in the embedding space, other people try to make the prediction um, be in like the manifold of possible futures. And then you train, you know, with an adversarial loss or again, um, in order to make that happen. And this is a problem we've been thinking for a while. And in this work, we are going to pursue a, a different direction. So we are basically going to change the underlying geometry so that the average actually has some meaning. And instead of trying to fix this problem and, and try to not predict the average, we are actually going to redefine what it means to predict the mean or the average, right? So like um, kind of, we're trying to give it a, a some meaning to the mean. Um, but well, before I can do that, um, I just have to go back to the, let's say, basics of Euclidean geometry and see what are we going to change from those basics and you know start from there. So here, what I'm showing you is basically um, something, something that's called a you know five postulates of plane geometry that Euclid um, stated several thousand years ago, and these are basically just axioms or statements that are assumed to be true, and from which we let's say build geometry. And you know, one of, example of such a statement is there is one and only one line segment between any two given points, and the other statements are similar. Um, however, there's the fifth one that's called the parallel postulate that this is a statement that can actually be challenged. And let's see how we can challenge this statement. And by challenging it, we will basically change the geometry, right? So the statement says, given any straight line in a point that's not on that line, um, there exists one and only one straight line which passes through that point and never intersects the first line, which basically means there's only one possible parallel line. And this is true in Euclidean geometry, but it's not true in other geometries. Specifically, it's not true for hyperbolic geometry. 
So if we change that axiom and and replace it for a similar one, but like let's say a let's say the equivalent one in hyperbolic geometry, then it says given a line in a point that's not on that line, there are infinitely many lines through that point that are parallel to the given line. So instead of one, now we have infinite um, possible parallel lines. In order to visualize this, um, well, this cannot be very intuitive, maybe. So I'll just like show several visualizations of, um, and say intuitive visualizations of hyperbolic space in order to develop an intuition. So the first one actually represents that axiom, right? So in, in Euclidean space that I represented here with this um, square, obviously Euclidean space goes to infinity. So I just represented a constraint, you know, um, let's say a part of the Euclidean space. But basically it looks like this, you have a line, you have a point that's not on the line, and then there's only one possible way of creating a parallel line through the original line. The hyperbolic space is a little bit different. Um, the way we represent it is with a disk. Um, there are different ways of representing hyperbolic space, but here we represent it with a disk. This is called a point curve disk. And basically the, this is the origin of the space and then the edge of the disk represents infinity. So all the points in the hyperbolic space are contained in this disk that I draw here. And then lines and, and points look like this. They have a curvature and then if we have a line in a point that is not on that line, there are infinitely many possible ways of creating lines that do not intersect with the original line and cross that point. So this is basically just um, the explanation of what it means to change that fifth um, axiom. Now, in order to be slightly more um, slightly more technical, uh, the hyperbolic space is basically a, a Riemannian geometry that has constant negative curvature and Let's say just to, to understand what this may mean, like in Euclidean space is a space with no curvature, spherical space is a space that has constant positive curvature, and then this one has constant negative curvature. It's slightly more complex to visualize than, than um, positive curvature, but we can still you know, try to visualize and, and have some in kind of intuition. Um, I'll go to that um, in a second, but basically very briefly, you know, to be a little bit more general, when we're talking about a, a Riemannian geometry, basically what we need is a space or a manifold, and then a way of computing, um, let's say inner product between the points in that space. So Euclidean space is a specific case in which you have like Euclidean inner product, but you can have other kinds of, you know, um, define the inner product in a different way. And then once you have any other product, you, it kind of determines the way you compute angles between points and distances between points. And eventually what you get is basically a space in which distances work in a different way than you know, Euclidean space. In, and this gives us a different set of tools that, that we can use. Now, going back to the hyperbolic space, there are different ways of representing it. And maybe the most, um, let's say, intuitive one, or like um, famous one, original one, is the hyperboloid model. And this is basically just a hyperboloid, like the blue one that I show you in this slide. And that you know formal, follows this equation of the hyperboloid. And all the points in the hyperboloid are the points in the hyperbolic space. And then if we want to compute the distance between the points in this hyperbolic model, instead of computing the regular Euclidean distance that you, let's say you would travel going from one point to the other in, the, in this space, we compute it using the hyperbolic angle between these two points. So it's just diff basically a different way of computing the distance, which results in a different geometry. Um, another way of representing the hyperbolic space, which is the one that we use in this work, and also the one that is mostly used in, uh, with like you know um, hyperbolic embeddings in machine learning, is the Poincaré disk. So these two different, like the, the Poincaré disk can be represented by this disk here, which is basically a projection called stereographic projection of all the points in the hyperboloid to to this disk here with like norm one unit norm, and Obviously, these two models are equivalent. All the points are equivalent. There's like isometries. So um, it's just that the way of understanding the space and the distance functions, they change. And specifically, the distance function that we will use in the point carry disk is this one here, like in this in this equation that I'm showing you. Um, so basically, just you know, to summarize this slide, what we have is that we have a space with a slightly different geometry than the Euclidean one in which the distance function is computed with this equation. And the points in that space are the points constrained in a disk of norm one. When we have more than two dimensions, instead of, called, instead of calling it a disk, it's called a ball 
point curve ball, but same idea. Now, as I said before, there's been um, you know quite a lot of work recently. So this is like the last three years, maybe, um, where people have started using um, hyperbolic embeddings uh, for different fields like NLP. It's, this is mostly work on NLP, but also now recently there's also some work in vision. And this is something that's you know starting to um, grow the literature. And what we've been doing specifically is investigating this direction for um, predictive modeling for videos you know, instead of you know NLP or the modalities. So we apply this to predictive modeling of videos. Now, as I promised, uh, first, you know, before diving into our method, I will try to develop a little bit of an intuition of how you know hyperbolic space, what hyperbolic space means, or you know, what it, you know, how can we kind of make sense of it. Um, so the first observation is that uh, geodesics, actually, let me explain what geodesic means. A geodesic is basically the curves between the curve between two points, um, such that you know, the curve that connects two points using the shortest path between those two points. So in, in Euclidean space, uh, the geodesic is basically a straight like line segment between the two points, as shown here on the left. But in hyperbolic space, it's a curved um, um, line. At least, you know, it's not, not straight from our Euclidean eyes. And the intuition behind this is that because I said the edge of the ball represents infinity, it means that the distances here, like closer to the edge, are larger distances than the ones that are um, close to the origin. And then, if we were, if let's say that we were to travel a path through this, you know, through this curve here, we'd be traveling much larger distances um, because this space is much larger than this one. Um, I think this will be like more intuitive the more visualizations I show. Um, so, the next, let's say, um, intuition is about the mean. And this is an important remark. If I compute the mean, and again, let me define what the mean is. So we define the mean as um, that point that minimizes the sum of square distances to, let's say, the, the input points or the points um, on which you compute the mean. So if we want to minimize the sum of square, like the point that minimizes the sum of square distances to each one of these points turns out to be the mean, which is this pink point in Euclidean space. And while in hyperbolic space, if we want to compute the mean, um, between these two points, we get this pink um, point here. Now, this has an interesting property, which is that the mean between these two points is actually closer to the origin than any of the other two points um, separately. So when you compute the mean um, you, like between these two points, you actually get a point that is closer to the origin. And you know, I'll give a, a little bit more details later, but this is something that I would like you to keep in mind because it's an interesting observation that will be useful later. And it kind of you know adds kind of kind of a new dimension when you compute them in. There are other properties. These are not that you know key for our work, but still can be helpful to develop some intuition. The first one is that in Euclidean space, angles in a triangle must add up to 180 degrees, and in hyperbolic space, they are strictly less than 180 degrees. This is related also to the fact that you cannot have rectangles in hyperbolic space, in case someone was considering if that's possible. Um, and finally, the last point is that, well, this is really what I was saying before, the space in, in, hyperbolic, in the, you know, the hyperbolic point carry disk grows exponentially, let's say it's exponentially dense away from the origin, which means that there's like more and more, let's say space here in this region than closer to the origin. And you know, if we try to draw a, a circle around a specific point in hyperbolic space, it looks like this, where this distance is actually, you know, this radius is actually equal to, to this distance here but it's kind of more compressed towards the edge. Um, yeah, so now I added this slide because it's cool, but also I think it's helpful to understand intuition. So this is basically some drawings that MC Escher did in the 50s, and he was like a graphical artist. He has very cool work, and basically it's just a tessellation in which you repeat geometrical patterns um, you know, to create some art or whatever, and then he basically did this in the point curve disk. Now, it's also interesting like for our purposes, not just because it's cool, but also because it helps us understanding a little bit the intuition behind it. Uh, specifically, the, the area, if you let me, the area of each one of these bats here, like each one of all of the bats here in this image is actually the same area for all of them. So 
like or or like similarly the area of each one of these fish here um, is exactly the one uh, the same area as each one of these other like smaller fish somewhere else, which kind of helps us at least it helps me get an intuition of how the space grows exponentially, um, like gets compressed exponentially as we approach the edge of the ball. Uh, yeah. So again, if you have some questions or like whatever, just feel free to ask. This is just a fun fact. Uh, lettuce leaves have negative curvature. Um, other elements in nature too, but I'll just leave it here. So if you want to keep something from this talk, you can remember this one. And now a little bit like more seriously, now you may be wondering, okay, um, you know, we're talking about predicting the future of video and you know different levels of abstraction at which we can predict and and so on. So why did I start talking about hyperbolic space and didn't just stay with Euclidean space, right? And obviously the answer is that there are some properties of Euclidean space that we don't like, or there's, you know, it has some limitations, let's say. The most important limitation for us uh, is that Euclidean space cannot embed trees or any other hierarchical graph, not at least without a lot of distortion. And to see what I mean by this, I just draw here a tree. This is a very simple tree graph. And I embedded it in like the, to the Euclidean space. So like this, the slide is like a to the Euclidean space. And distortion means that basically the three distances are not kept in the, as you know, in the, like say Euclidean distances are not the same as the three distances. So let me, let me just give you an example. If we want to compute the distance between this node in the tree and this node in the tree, the tree distance is actually two because we have to jump you know, two edges, cross two edges. So that the tree distance is true or graph distance is two. But the Euclidean distance between them is square root of three, so there is there is some distortion going on. And no matter how you you know try to embed this tree in the Euclidean, like you know the two D Euclidean space, it's basically impossible to embed it without any distortion. And as you may have guessed, hyperbolic space doesn't have this limitation. So you can embed trees without you know with let's say very little distortion, and they look a little bit like this, in which the root of the tree is closer to the origin. And then the leaf nodes of the tree get embedded closer to the edge of the ball. A little bit intuition of why you can do this. And again, this is not very formal, but a little bit intuition is that because the space grows exponentially, even if the number of nodes in the tree grow exponentially, the space can still, let's say, fit all of them. And you know, this has been shown. There's several work where um, they've been, you know, developing different algorithms to embed trees more efficiently, and even so some other kinds of hierarchical graphs that are not exactly trees that can also be embedded much better in hyperbolic space than Euclidean space. And again, you know, um, the length of each edge represented here is, well, is like the same. So this one has the same length as, as this edge here and so on. So now finally, uh, we can go back to our initial example. Well, the third example I showed, right? Um, and understand why we're talking about trees and why we want to embed trees in hyperbolic space. So actually, let me play this again. No, the reason um, why we want to embed, think about trees is that we understand uncertainty as a hierarchy. So in this specific example from the office, it may be very hard to predict the future at a very specific level in this hierarchy. Like for example, like if I ask you to predict um, what kind of handshake they will, um, there will be, it's basically impossible. If I go up like one other level of abstraction and ask you to predict between, you know, handshake and some kind of palm smack, it's also very hard uh, or like in clear. So we can always go back another level of abstraction up until we are more certain. In this specific case, if we go up to like, to this level here, it's kind of easy to predict that this will be like some kind of hand contact instead of some, you know, hug or something else. But if, even if we weren't certain, uh, we can always go back, you know, another up level in the hierarchy and predict greet as opposed to dance, or like even easier predict interact as opposed to eat or something like that. So we can always go up levels in the hierarchy if we are uncertain. So that's why we understand uncertainty as a hierarchy. And now, kind of relating everything that I said, because we want to encode um, hierarchy, sorry, uncertainty, uh, let's say in a natural way, and hierarchy encodes uncertainty. And also hyperbolic spaces are very good at encoding hierarchy. Then what you're going to do is basically build a predictive model um, in the hyperbolic space that is naturally going to encode this hierarchy. 
And the next slides will be more specific, but this is the main idea. So this is just a reminder of the setup of our problem. Um, remember, you, you know, you had the, we had these um, red frames, and then we want to predict something about the blue frames, which is the future. And the only difference with like the, the slide I showed before is that in this case, the prediction will be in terms of features or representations in the point variable instead of Euclidean space. That's what I showed before. Now, um, what we want actually is like, well, let's see, if we were able to observe these blue frames, they would get embedded here in this blue point, like that we will call Z. So Z is, let's say, the actual um, future, the actual prediction that we want to predict. And, but we actually don't know where this embedding is, right? So, you know, this, this given this past, um, all of this could be possible future. So maybe this one is representing something like um, landing and facing forward. The other one is representing something like landing but falling down to the ground and so on. So all these, all these are, let's say all the possible futures that we may predict even the past. Now, what we actually want is something like this. We want to predict a point, this like red point here, that given the red frames encompasses all the possible futures. And this is like the motivation of, of this work is like, um, and then I guess, I guess the question is how can we do that? How can we get to this point, right? Um, so before answering this specific question, I will try to relate all the previous ideas to this um, diagram here, like in, into this red point here and try to relate all, all the previous intuition that I've been explaining. First intuition is about uncertainty and certainty. So because this red, like this red point actually represents all the possible futures, if this red point uh, was somewhere closer to the origin of the ball, like somewhere here, it would encompass more possible futures. And if you want encompass more possible futures, means that you're more uncertain about the specific future. If this red point was like closer to the edge of the ball, it would encompass like less um, possible futures, which means that the prediction would be more confident about the specific future. So in a way, this radius, and I'll call it radius, like the, the distance from the origin to the red point, I'll call it the radius of the prediction, uh, tells us, um, gives us like some, some measure of uncertainty or certainty. Um, if I am uncertain, I will have like a, a low, like small radius. If the prediction is certain, it will have a large radius. We can also relate this diagram here, actually to the um, hierarchical tree that I, that I draw before, that I showed before. So if I'm very certain, remember, like if we were very certain about the prediction, we're going to predict the very specific level in the hierarchy. We're going to predict you know, a specific kind of handshake, which means that I'm going to predict uh, at the node that's close to the edge of the ball. If you remember when we embed trees in the Point curve ball, the, the leaf nodes get embedded close to the edge of the ball. Did that question? Oh, I, yeah, yeah, sure. Is, is, uh, is, is ground truth always um, sort of at the edge of the point curve disk? Is it infinitely precise, ground truth? So, no, the ground truth is not, um, is also learned. So, the ground truth could be somewhere closer to the um, origin, let's say, but then you wouldn't have like, but yeah, exactly. But then let's see, you train them jointly with the prediction, right? Um, I'll show you in a what would, later. What would be a situation when ground truth is less certain? So we haven't like in all in our experiments, it turns out that the ground truth is actually because it's a very it's very specific, you know, in the end, like the the representation space is the same for both the prediction and the and the ground truth. So it means which means that basically they have the same intuition about certainty and uncertainty. And the specific grant is also very specific because you're given the specific frames you're representing. So it turns out it always represents them close to the edge, which kind of follows our intuition. If they were represented somewhere um, closer to the origin, my guess is that it, this would mean that even given the frames, it's not clear what's going on. So there's still some uncertainty. In which case, if you want to predict something that's already very uncertain, even after you've seen it, then your prediction should be even more uncertain than that. And you would still get something like this, where the prediction is more uncertain than the actual ground truth, but kind of moved more towards the, the origin. But in, yeah, in our experiments, let's say, 
um, all the predictions are always have, have like a larger radius. Sorry, all the features, ground truth of the actual future have a larger radius than the prediction. So we get a schematic that's very similar to this one. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So what I was thinking for is, is you know, we have this idea of um, tree, a hierarchical tree that represents uncertainty in the same way. So in which the, if you predict a leaf node in the tree, then it means that you're very confident and at the very, about, you know, a specific prediction. And then this would get embedded close to the edge of the ball. And the closer we get to the origin, the more we go like towards the root of the tree, which, which means like we are more uncertain about the prediction. We would try to be more general, you know, hedging the bet a little bit. And well, of course, like this is, even now, yeah, I was talking about trees and so on, but this space is continuous. So we get, you know, we've not been coding a discrete hierarchy, but a continuous one. But, you know, the intuition is the same um, as, as, you know, as, as we would have for a, for a discrete hierarchy. Yeah. So now in order to train our framework, uh, we basically use the last function that, you know, this is like contrastive, um, regular contrastive learning is a loss function that minimizes the uh, you know the distance between the prediction and and the actual um, ground truth um, um, future and you know in this case specifically is the square distance and then we have another term here the second term which is basically the normalizing um, constant that's you know um, necessary to normalize the probability distribution also to avoid the model finding shortcuts and having everything going to the origin and you know like this is classical contrastive loss. We don't have anything new here, except for one thing, which is that now the distances are, you know, we change the distance function and we replace it with, you know, the hyperbolic distance function I was um, like, talking about. So this, instead of being a including distance function, now is a hyperbolic distance function. That's the main change. And then I guess the question now is like, why is this an object, um, you know, is this objective a good idea and also, why, like, how does this objective bring us closer to this idea of like this red point and all the intuition that I developed about it? Well, it turns out that, and this is something that's related to the intuition I said before, when, when you compute the mean of all these points here, all the possible futures, in hyperbolic space, you actually get this red point. So this red point is the mean of all these possible futures, and this just comes from the hyperbolic geometry. And because this loss, um, is actually minimizing the the mean of all the possible futures. So like it's minimizing the square distance between, you know, the prediction and the actual value. And this, this is actually how we define the mean um, or the expected value of the mean. Then this is exactly what the model is doing. The model is like, if you want to minimize the loss, it actually will result in the mean, which in hyperbolic space is this point. Um, you know, so all this intuition about uncertainty, abstraction, hierarchy, and so on, it comes naturally just from this loss, which is the contrastive, um, you know, just minimizing some square distance, um, but in hyperbolic space. Um, and just, you know, to insist a little bit on this tree structure that's also, for me, is very intuitive. Let's say if you compute the mean in hyperbolic space between two leaf nodes, like the mean between handshake and high five, it would result in the parent node, in this case, grid. And this is just by means of how um, hyperbolic geometry works. So well, there's just a lot of ways of obtaining these representations. Um, we are going to use neural networks, um, not very surprisingly. And in terms of the architecture, we we use the standard one for video prediction that we just got from DPC. And we change it so that it can work in hyperbolic space and we can apply hyperbolic distance to it. Um, it basically means having some projection from Euclid to hyperbolic, but but it, the architecture is basically the same one, just that now we work um, in representations of the hyperbolic space. And another, oh yeah, another thing about architecture is that um, when we just train, you know, a whole system self-supervisedly um, with the laws I was explaining before, but then in order to test it, we basically train a linear classifier on a downstream task. That's what is regularly done um, to evaluate self-supervised learning representations. And in this case, because the space is, is a hyperbolic space, we cannot just train a regular Euclidean linear classifier, but we have to train a, a hyperbolic one, which is 
uh, very similar. You still train, you know, for each class, you get a hyperplane um, and then you compute the distances with respect to the hyperplane. It's just that in, in the point carry space, uh, the hyperplanes look like look like these like curved lines instead of just like straight lines um, and similarly for higher dimensions. But basically, same idea. We just train a linear classifier on top um, on, of the frozen features um, in order to test the model. Specifically, um, we run experiments on two different sets of data. So we train first on um, without any labels on the kinetics data set. And then we evaluate these representations on the fine gym data set, which is a gymnastics data set. Again, in order to do so, you know, we freeze the representations and then train a linear classifier on top. Um, and we chose a fine gym data set because it has a very nice hierarchical structure and not just hierarchical structure, but also hierarchical annotations that are convenient to evaluate our, um, you know, the representations learned by our model. However, we never use any kind of hierarchical annotations during the training at all. This is just um, to evaluate the learned hierarchy, but we never use it during training. And then we do the same for, for a movie domain, um, where again, we train the whole model with a large unlabeled data set and then test it on a smaller, um, train a classifier on top and, and, and test it there. And, because the goal of the project is basically learning to handle uncertainties when predicting the future, the tasks we run these experiments on are two tasks that involve predicting the future. So first we evaluate on future action prediction and we also evaluate on early action recognition. Um, early action recognition is basically um, predicting an action when it has only been partially observed. But all of these require predicting the future. So once the model has been trained, let me drink a little bit of water. So once the model has been trained, we can basically visualize the results and see how they encode uncertainty. So in this example, what I'm showing here is basically a clip of a gymnast doing an exercise. And the task is to predict the last action the gymnast will do. And each time step, the model uses all the information av available so far, right? So this task is a hard one. Um, and basically, the more information you get and also the closer you, you are to the actual um, action, the easiest, the easier it will be for the model. So here, what I plot here in like this, let's say the second row, is the radius of the prediction, where larger radius are you know, down here. So what we can see is that the radius of the prediction is smaller when the system is like at the beginning, when there's not a lot of information, which means that the prediction shows a little bit of uncertainty. And the more information we get and closer we get to the actual um, prediction and the actual future, the radius grows and grows. And, and this just happens naturally um, without us encoding any kind of um, bias to it, except for just, you know, just the geometry of the hyperbolic space. And the next thing I showed here at the bottom is the result of the linear classifier. So because the, you know, fine gym data set has different levels of hierarchy, what we do is we basically train a classifier for each level. And where, you know, like maybe the, the bottom levels are represent more specific features, um, actions like, you know, whatever more specific sub actions and then um, larger like top levels represent more generic actions. Now uh, there's, there's like, you know, in order to relate these two, there's an important um, step that, that I think is pretty nice from our framework, which is uh, we need at some point, we need to select a level in this hierarchy in order to predict. And this comes naturally from our representation because we only have to look at the value of the radius. If the radius is very small, it means that the system is uncertain. And then we will try to predict something at the low, like up, like upper level of the hierarchy. If we are very, like let's say the system is very certain about the specific prediction and predicts like a representation with a large radius, then we can go and predict at the lower level of the hierarchy, which is more specific. And we can just do it, do it by fixing some, some thresholds in the value of the radius, you know, fix some thresholds for the whole data set. And then we can basically select the whole, um, select a specific level. And so therefore the, you know, the framework does not only result in a hierarchy, but also in a natural way of selecting a level in this hierarchy. Uh, so, you know, I, I run several, the same, let's say this figure can be run in NVIDIA and uh, on our website, um, we have like a lot of such videos in case you're interested. And they look something like this, in which we have um, a video. It's like the same as the same as this video I'm showing here at the top, 
I'm showing here the left, and then here at the bottom is the evolution of the radius of the prediction. So I, every time step, I like I predict some specific. Um, in this case, the action is early action recognition. So I'm at every time step, I predict, or the, the model predicts uh, this specific action. And then what we will see is how over time the radius decreases. So it increases in value, which means that over time the system is more and more confident. And here at the right, I will play it now in a second. And here at the right, what I'm showing is the result, like the, the classification result. And at which we predict, like, I show basically all, not just the specific class that is predicted, but also the specific level at which we predict. So if we play this video, we can see that over time, the system is more confident in general on the specific prediction. And also when it crosses the threshold, it basically opens up like a new level in the hierarchy and predicts at this more, more specific level. So if I play it again, first we predict only at this level. And the second it crosses the threshold, we can predict the more specific level. And there's you know several such videos. It's like also early action prediction for for Hollywood too. Those are some some examples for again these are uh, there's like a lot of videos like this in the website and most of them follow this trend here where the more information I get and the closer I am to the actual value I want to predict, the more confident I am like the the, the model is and therefore <clears throat> the the larger the radius the radius gets. Indeed, I have another question for you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it typically you train, you know, in, uh, in Euclidean space, you train a classifier. If you have a novel instance, some unseen class, you know, it'll, 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 uh, it'll, it'll make some prediction, which is sort of, you know, in between uh, some of the existing classes, maybe it, it, it'll have low confidence and so on. Um, but it's really interesting your, your, with your model where you have a separate way of sort of encoding um, certainty about how sure a model is about what's going to happen versus whether it fits into one of the known classes or not. It's like, so do you ever have situations where the model is quite certain about what happens, so the radius is large, but um, but it doesn't actually match one of your ground truth classes. It's like sort of in between. Do you, like can you can you use that to discover like new classes where the model knows exactly what's going on? It just doesn't have a name for it. It wasn't part of the maybe the little labeled training data or something. Yeah. So we haven't really tried this, um, but there's here there's like two things that I mean I think you distinguish them, but just you know just to make sure. First, you know there's the pre-training in which you basically learn this embedding space that. Is not associated to any specific class, or you know, just like a continuous space. Um, and then there's the training you do on top of that, in which you train a classifier in order to you know separate um, the the regions in that space, right? Um, so I think the the overall framework um, could work to do what you're uh, mentioning. However, the specific way we classify it and like we train the classifier on top is limited as the same way the Euclidean, the Euclidean one is. However, if we design, I think it's, we can basically design a, let's say, maybe like the, the first solution I can come up with, like more hard coded if you want, but basically based on the value of the prediction, if it's not very confident, um, maybe it's because there's a new class. However, it may be confusing because here I'm, basically what I'm trying to um, convey is that uncertainty comes from the unpredictability of the future, not so much from the fact that I don't know exactly what that specific future that I represent is called. So then we would be like mixing two kinds of uncertainty. Um, and I think you know, it's possible to handle it, just not, not direct and definitely not directly from the specific classifier we're training. I don't know if that's... And if I can just add, add, David, I think it's a really, really an, an, an interesting question here. Um, <clears throat> I think what's really exciting about this hyperbolic geometry is it's basically a very good inductive bias for any hierarchical uh, data. And there's hierarchies er everywhere, um, right? Um, and yeah, can like, for, I think what you're saying is very interesting is can you use hyperbolic geometry to facilitate tr transfer? You know, can you do, can you do, can you do tr tr transfer learning? I think that'd be very cool. Yeah, anyways, yep. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right. 
So, I mean, this is also, you know, um, not, I, th I think this is like promising in the sense that there's a lot of things we can do here and it's definitely a lot of things to explore. Um, and so we can also take a look at specific values taken by uh, these representations. And here, what I'm basically I'm showing is um, specific values of the prediction, like the Z hat I was saying before, uh, in which like every line represents a specific clip. And then this is the evolution over time of these features. So like, for example, if we follow this blue line here, uh, these represent the Z hat at time step zero, time step one, time step two, and so on, where the, the, the red dot represents the Z, the specific feature. And this relates to the first question you asked the, in which um, basically the, the, the specific features always gets closer, are like embedded closer to the edge of the point curve ball, even though we never really hard code that information. And here, what I'm showing is like two dimensional representation of our feature space. In practice, we train with 256 dimensions. So it just, it just plotted the two dimensions with the highest variance in the activations. But basically here again, just like the, the main point is that the, the features get more specific, the more information we get. And this is general for, for the, all the data sets and all the predictions. It's not just a, I didn't just cherry pick two dimensions. Or, or specific examples, but this occurs like through all the examples and all the data sets, the more information we get, the larger the radius is and like the more certain the system is. There are other fun and interesting applications of this framework. Uh, I think, you know, like there's a lot of them that you can think of. Um, <clears throat> like for example, you can you know, classify videos according to their predictability, which kind of gives us some sense of um, entropy of the video, how hard, how hard there is to predict and that may be useful for some applications and so on, like maybe for transfer learning, uh, we could also use that and to detect, you know, appearance of new classes. And, but also then just, okay, the, in this slide, I'm basically showing um, not just visualizations, but some quantitative results. And again, this is for act, early action recognition and, and future action prediction. So first we show results for future action prediction in FindGem, in which we showed three different accuracy metrics uh, the first one is just prediction accuracy, just regular classification at the lowest level of the hierarchy, as you know, any any regular classification would work. And then we also show top-down hierarchical accuracy and bottom-up hierarchical accuracy, which basically get, take into account all the different levels of the hierarchy, putting more weight in the bottom nodes, like bottom levels or like upper levels. We report the two of them because in the literature there's papers working with both, so we just report the two of them and we compare um, chance values with some simple baselines. But the most important baseline that we want to compare with is the Euclidean one, in which this is basically the same system as ours, exactly the same system, but trained with an Euclidean distance in, a, in an Euclidean space. And in this specific task um, that basically involves a lot of uncertainty in the prediction, it's a, it's a hard task. Um, having representations that can naturally handle this uncertainty is very convenient. And because hierarchical space actually is very good at um, handling this uncertainty, uh, these values are better than the Euclidean ones. For early action prediction in Hollywood 2, we get like, you know, similar lessons can apply, but in this case, maybe the advantage is not as large, but still we get some improvement. And also interestingly, if we run the same experiment, but with like a lower number of dimensions, like instead of 256, we use like 50, um, 64 dimensions. What you can see is the Euclidean um, values, well, the Euclidean model has actually very hard time training. It was hard to make it train, but the Euclidean the hyperbolic models do not get much worse than with 256 dimensions. And this, this actually, interestingly, is consistent with previous work in hyperbolic embeddings, in which you know previous papers have also shown that the decrease in accuracy when you decrease a lot the number of dimensions is is not as important in hyperbolic spaces as in, as it is in Euclidean space. So this is interesting, you know, if you want to work with compression or some other application like this. And it also gives us some intuition about how the space may work. And you know, just as a final note, uh, if we like take a step back and and look at where hierarchies can appear in action and like in video, uh, it, they actually appear everywhere. Uh, so like if we look at this specific figure here, this is a, a figure from a paper from 70 years ago. This is not even a vision paper. It's like, um, let's say, psychology paper where they study how humans understand actions and how humans understand goals. And it turns out humans, we understand goals in a hierarchical way. 
if I ask you like, what are you doing now? You can answer, well, I'm crossing the street, but you can also ask answer something like, I'm getting an education because I'm crossing the street to go to school. So overall I'm getting an education. Um, but all of these is true at the same time. All of these different answers are different levels of, like in a, you know, in a hierarchy and all of them are true at the same time. So we think this direction is very important you know, to represent these hierarchies and it's also a very promising way of representing video and representing actions. So this is it, like I'm just showing here the website. We have the paper code models, more visualizations there in case you're interested. If you have more questions, you can ask them now or you can send me an email um, or whatever. I just wanna ask, I, I yeah. um, so what was the top down or bottom up hierarchy accuracy? Oh yeah. Definition basically. So top down is basically, it is a simple metric in which you compute classification accuracy at every level in the hierarchy. And then you basically weight the levels, weight the levels of like each level of the hierarchy using a different weight. Like um, in the top down accuracy, you consider the general, general levels to be more important because the intuition is that you cannot be wrong at those levels. So you weight them with like a weight of one and maybe you divide the weight by two at every, um, level that you go down. Bottom-up accuracy is similar, but the other way around. So you consider the most important level to be uh, the bottom one because it's the hardest one. And then uh, you like weight that one by one, and then you like let's say you decrease the weight as you go up. But it's just um, very similar into like let's say very similar technical details, slightly different notation. Thank you. So I, I have a question on this, I, I guess on the intuition of sort of the, the combination of, you know, or the mapping of the hyperbolic space to sort of probabilities. So it's, um, I guess, is there something like an explicit mapping? So number one, where you say, okay, you know, you have a, I don't know, a, a, dist, a distance, certain distance to the origin corresponds to a certain probability. So, so that is the first one. Then the second one is, right now you always have kind of point estimates of the uncertainties, but how would you translate that into maybe modeling distributions in this space? So to answer the first question, no, uh, there's not, I mean, at least not that I know, there's not a clear direct way of relating the radius uh, or like closeness to the origin or closeness to the edge with a probability value. Also, it's uncertain what this probability would mean. Like, is it, the, is it a probability of the parent node or probability of each one of the smaller nodes? Like it's not, it's not clear, but also no, like we don't have a direct way of computing a probability of, of confidence, like a value of confidence. I mean, the value of confidence can be the radius, but, but I think it's easier to understand it in a, in a sense of a hierarchy instead of a probability, so no. Um, and the second one, I guess first you can probably just use probabilistic models um, the same way you use it in Euclidean space. Like you can um, predict the distribution on top of the hyperbolic space. I don't know if that would help because then you would be, let's say, combining two different ways of measuring uncertainty and probably the intuition would fail at least for one of them. So in case you want to use probabilistic models, maybe you can stick to um, Euclidean space. But I guess you can still like, you know, train hyperbolic models and, and you know, predict the distribution instead of a deterministic point in hyperbolic space. But again, I'm not sure how that would, what that would imply. Well, you could then sample from it, for example. Yeah, but like from the point of view of, of uncertainty, um, from the, yeah, exactly. But from the point of view of uncertainty, it's not as clear um, for me what that would mean. Um, I guess you can still sample from it um, let's say that okay, it is not, not very technically correct, but in a way, like if you have this red point and you know the level at which you want to predict, you can still like create this cone. There's, there's some other work in something that's called, um, hyperbolic cone embeddings and, and something like that in which they understand this point as basically, um, the origin of a, of a cone and everything that's contained in that cone, um, is a specific subcase of this point. And then you, a, any point that you could sample from inside of this point would be a specific case of, of this representation. So it's technically not called from, you know, sampling from a probabilistic distribution, but you could still understand it in this way. Um, cool. 
uh, maybe we have time for one last question. Yes, I, I have a small question about uh, the like when you train the linear like the hyperbolic classifiers. Uh, is it possible uh, with this like if I understand when you're training these classifiers, you are only contrasting with all the child classes of your parent, or you're or you're comparing with your like all the classes at the same level of the hierarchy? Here uh, we are comparing with all the classes at the specific level of the hierarchy separately for each level. The reason we did that is because in the Euclidean space, it's not as, you know, it's like in order to be fair with the Euclidean space comparison, you want to have a way of evaluating that also works for the Euclidean space. But there's a lot of different possible ways of doing this in hierarchies. And there's a lot of possibilities, so we just chose the simplest one. Another possibility would be, you know, you first choose the parent node, then within that parent node, you train a classifier, then within that specific parent, you train another classifier, and then you train like several classifiers given a parent node. Um, you can do the same, just, you know, you can understand it the same way and just train a classifier for all the children nodes. And then when you select the children, you basically get all the parents for free. So it's another way. This is basically what regular accuracy means. So there's like a lot of different possibilities. And, and we just selected like one that kind of was simple, but made some sense. And it was easy also to, like it made, it was fair for the Euclidean baseline. So in this setting, you could actually predict one child that is different, like whose parent is different from the parent that you predicted, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, Dirac, like, thanks so much for the talk and for presenting this very exciting work. And it was a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, hi, Dirac. Sorry, I missed the beginning. Hey. Uh, Carl, no good to see you. Well, good to see you. Yeah, this is great. I wish I'd be recording some. Okay, goodbye everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.